till now what we have discussed everything has to do with the sensory processes so it's only sensation that we have been talking about till now we have talked about the basic fact that uh, the information uh, comes from the environment it is received by the sense modalities we have several sense modalities uh, and then uh, there is a transduction process wherein uh, these sensation gets converted into uh, impulses in the brain the these messages are carried forward in the brain and then it is processed what we have also discussed till now is the concept of a threshold wherein uh, uh, minimum level of uh, sensation is needed uh, so that the brain can receive it it can process it when we talked about the just noticeable difference another concept that is uh, interesting and it has to do with the concept of the just noticeable difference uh, is Weber's law. The practical utility of Weber's law uh, is to find out uh, how is it that when we make a distinction between any two objects, uh, when you say that find this is uh, better than that, say for example you say x is better than y or y is not as good as x, how do we make that distinction? So, Weber's law says that it is the change required for getting a stimulus received as different. Remember, you are making a distinction, you have to make the very conclusion you have to uh, arrive at that this stimulus is different from the previous one and the difference that you perceive that depends on uh, you know, how much change is required. So, there will always be a delta value that changed value that you have a stimulus of say a uh, level of uh, say this amount and then how much more should you add to it so that whoever looks at it says that yes this is definitely different from the previous one. So, you always will have any stimulus will have certain strength and more stronger the stimulus greater is the requirement so as to get it detected as different from the earlier one. Uh, you look at uh, all the examples of uh, uh, print advertisements for example, say you have uh, resorts, uh, hotels, uh, holiday uh, trips, you have travel agencies, several advertisements you see. You always find that for certain category of products or services, you have uh, no very, very uh, no distinct images uh, that gets uh, placed in the advertisement. What you actually do is that you know that your uh, product, your service has to be identified much different from others because you have uh, a competition in the market and therefore, to increase this sensitivity, you add these extra features. So, for example, if you look at this ad, you have uh, no, uh, too many things that gets uh, no, uh, visible in this advertisement. Besides the text, you have a uh, great deal of uh, no, picturous location, color, tin, texture, what it has, it has water, it has rocks, it has sun, it has a sky, cloud, several things are given here. This actually uh, is needed according to Weber's law because you want to place this very service of yours compared to others and you want that this should definitely be perceived better as compared to the earlier one. So, till now we have discussed uh, how we sense the incoming information from the environment and whatever we have discussed everything has to do with sensation. So, sensation therefore, refers only to the stimulation that one receives from the sense modalities. So, you have your uh, sense modalities which are uh, designed to receive information from the external environment, you have uh, these uh, information coming in, these impulses uh, get uh, further trans, uh, it further gets uh, you know, transferred to certain areas of the brain and it is actually this entire process of sensation actually precedes perception. So, to ensure that the sense modality has received the stimulation, it has to reach a minimum threshold what is called as the absolute threshold. And as we have discussed that uh, absolute threshold actually refers to the minimum intensity of the stimulus that can be detected by a receiver minimum 50 percent of the times. Now, once we have sensed uh, whatever impulse we have received, we start attaching a meaning to it. So, when we attach a meaning to what we have sensed, perception is supposed to have taken place. And therefore, 
whatever we experience is our perception. The sensory cues that are uh, received by the brain and the relevant past experiences that one already has, uh, they help us uh, organize and derive a meaning. Now, remember one thing, your sense modality is receiving the sensation, uh, these sensations getting processed in the brain and the brain coming forward uh, with an interpretation. These are uh, no, uh, two distinct processes, one where it is purely uh, sensory system based. So, you process the information the way you receive, but then you also depend on your past experience uh, to attach a meaning to what you have seen. For example, uh, uh, say you see an object like this, now unless you have a past experience of what this is, it is very difficult to provide a meaning to it. So, in terms of uh, sensation, yes, you have something in your uh, visual field and you see it. Uh, your entire visual cortex processes it, we have discussed at length the entire visual uh, process, but then you fail to attach a meaning to it. Uh, little later we will also come to cases where uh, you know, we commit certain errors in terms of uh, you know, attaching meaning to what we have sensed, okay? the whole concept of illusions. And then even though you know what is there, still there are certain limitations of our uh, sensory processes wherein knowingly we still have those uh, sensory illusions that we will come little later. But right now what we are uh, discussing is that fine to attach a meaning to whatever you have sensed, uh, to interpret it we do need a repository of uh, information, those information that has come through our uh, past experience that will help us attach a meaning to uh, what is recently sensed. And therefore, both the information, thus the entire sensory input that has come to the brain and uh, the relevance of uh, our past experience, both uh, combines together in terms of organize the information, so that you provide the exact meaning to it. And therefore, one can also think that perception actually does not emulate reality, it is not a replica, because uh, you can still have difficulty in attaching a meaning to what you have sensed. And there could be a possibility where uh, say I perceive things differently compared to you. So, even though the object remains the same, the biologically the entire uh, biological process remains the same, the entire sensory processing remains the same, but irrespective of this constancy I and you uh, know can still come forward with different set of responses, different set of meanings that we provide to it. And the difference that we have in uh, in terms of providing meaning to what was constant actually represents the fact that we are not looking exactly at the reality, but we are actually attaching our meaning to it and it is the process of perception. The raw information received by the brain are always uh, transformed or reworked in order to uh, get perceived. So, it is not that the brain has received a signal, because if we look only at uh, the raw information that is being processed by the brain then your and my brain if uh, rest of the biological conditions uh, remain the same, then uh, the both the brains are supposed to process the information the same way, but that actually does not happen. And therefore, uh, all this information that we received in through our uh, sensory process actually gets reworked, it gets transformed and then uh, we attach uh, meaning to it, it makes a sense to us, it makes sense to rest of the world and therefore, we say that yes perception has taken place. And therefore, a percept is actually an outcome of mental processes such as form synthesis, feature differentiation and uh, recollection of the past experiences. All of this uh, along with the comparison of the stimuli actually helps us perceive things. And these operations can either be uh, top down or it could be bottom up. Now, remember one thing, we are talking that fine you are actually comparing to stimuli Right now, we talked about the Weber's law that you have a certain uh, you know, quantum of uh, sensation and if you want a difference to be detected, then there has to be a delta value attached to what the previous uh, stimulus had. So, the two stimuli when you have uh, you know, to make one realize that they are distinct, okay, some uh, you know, extra amount of uh, uh, sensation has to be added to it. This is what we discussed in the Weber's law. Now, 
you have to have the synthesis of the form you also have to look at the features and then you establish a distinction between the features that you are actually looking at you use your past experiences okay and therefore uh, the all these processes actually help you compare any given object in your environment when you perceive it and as uh, we discussed right now that it could be either a top down process or it could be a bottom up process the knowledge and memory pertaining to the stimuli and the language to understand and express it are crucial expectations and belief and motivation are also important all these constitute mental processes and are top down processes the environmental stimuli are processed by the sensory organs this leads to sensation these stimuli undergo perceptual organization based on their inherent characteristics these are the bottom up processes a synthesis of these two processes leads to identification or recognition of the stimuli let us now uh, talk about the nasser's perceptual uh, cycle in 1976 you nasser proposed a model integrating the bottom up and top down processes into a cyclic process this model focuses on perception attention and categorization while perceiving an object one selectively attends to the available information this is further modified by anticipatory schemata what is also important in perception is that any percept can be categorized as figure and background so while the pattern that becomes focus of attention becomes the figure the backdrop against which it emerges uh, becomes the background uh, for example Uh, when you are looking at me you see me because you look at me as an object or as a figure with uh, respect to the background in which i appear okay so what is interesting here is that you always have a focus uh, of attention i am the focus of attention and therefore uh, the green uh, board behind me becomes the background but think of a case Uh, when uh, you are actually looking at the green board something is written here on the blackboard you look at it and even though i stand in front of this board i am not actually the figure okay so this reversibility at times becomes possible and remember an interesting uh, thing here uh, that it is actually in the hands of uh, the perceiver the individual what you actually decide to lay emphasis upon what you decide to focus your attention upon and depending on what uh, is the focus of attention you decide uh, the figure and the background and always a figure has to be you uh, know perceived with respect to the background a figure of course therefore need not always be in front uh, you know or above the background for example right now when i say that you look at me with respect to the uh, green background uh, that lay, that lies behind me okay it is not always true that you look at me because i am the focus of attention there could be a possibility okay as i said that you are looking at the text written on this board and therefore your focus of attention is the text written on the board and not the person standing in front of it and therefore even though i stand in front of uh, this uh, green uh, board okay i become the background and the object of focus becomes the uh, figure the process of uh, you no know, making distinction between the figure and the background actually depends upon the search for contours so we what we do is that uh, we look at see the background and the figure and the uh, thin line of division between the two the contours when you detect you see that okay this divides the figure from the background the more hazy is this contour the more are uh, you know the chances of having the uh, reversibility in case of perception so contours is the gradient change between the elements of a percept and ambiguity in these contours actually leads to reversibility between the figure and the background and uh, right now uh, we will be just looking at trying to see what are available on the common domain on the internet when you search for you know uh, reversible figures where you have the minimality of uh, these contours you don't have the, that uh, no degree of gradient change okay and therefore it becomes very difficult your focus of attention keeps on shifting in reality actually uh, the contours are defined in most of the cases and therefore it's very easy for you 
to make a clear distinction between what the figure is and in what background you are looking at it. Therefore, edges and contours are very, very critical to the perceptual processes. For example, look at this case. Okay. Here you see an object that lies within uh, the background. It is extremely difficult for you to actually make out what you see. Okay. But when you look at me, it is very easy for you to make a very clear distinction what is uh, the object and in what background are you looking at it. The primary reason being that you can very easily you know have that uh, you know contour here okay, and you can see that uh, you know gradient change. This gradient change makes it extremely simpler for you, very, very easy for you to very clearly say that okay, this is the background and here a man stands in front of that green background. When you look at this image, you know, it is extremely difficult. Why? The white and the black patches that you see here, it represents uh, you know, the figure as well as the background and the chances of optical illusion maximizes here because you do not have a very you know, uh, sharp uh, you know, distinction between uh, the figure and the background, the contours are not well defined. Here look at it this image and I am sure you will be able to uh, you know, actually see a dog okay, which is uh, you know, looking at the ground. So, this is uh, you know, the importance of contours in perception. Now, look at uh, you know, different possibility, a possibility where the situation actually gives you an opportunity to you know, draw a contour of your own, what will be considered as subjective contours. Look at this image, what do you see? If I ask you, are you looking at a white triangle laid over uh, no, three circles? The answer could be yes for many of you. Or uh, no, if you just uh, no, perceive that no, it is actually no three independent circles okay, uh, with a piece cut out from each of them, okay, but there is no triangle as such. So, it could be very easily no, interpreted as if you actually look at three independent black circles with a piece cut out of them okay, and there is no triangle as such. But even though the background is white, okay, I am sure all of you would know when you look at this image, you automatically draw a line to complete the triangle okay, to perceive that there is a white triangle uh, you know, above this. This is subjective contour. Look at this image, just you have a white background and you have a line sketch, but you can very easily make out that fine, I am probably looking at a profile of a human being. You add a tint to it, it becomes much more distinct now. In the previous case, okay, still there was you know, only a line that was dividing it. Now, you have colored fill into it and if you, you know even you know diffuse the color, you know, the white background gets diffused somewhere in this gray on when you make it very, very distinct, complete black. Okay. Actually, in isolation when you look at these uh, you know, uh, profiles, you could you know still make a distinction, but when you put it against a colored background or when you have uh, you know, multiple objects on the screen, at times it becomes difficult and therefore, we always add subjectivity to uh, such cases where uh, contours are not well defined. We have already seen this image, let us look at it again. Look at the three black circles and the triangle. You can see a sharp gradient change between the circles, triangle and the background. Now, move the triangle and superimpose it over the three triangles. You still see the triangle by filling creative subjective lines. You do not see three circles with piece cut out of them. Well, you were aware that the triangle was superimposed on the circles. Now, see these three circles, they all have a piece cut out of them. Although this time a triangle has not been superimposed, you still perceive a white triangle uh, put over three black circles. This was an example to demonstrate the concept of subjective contours. We now come to an interesting uh, theory of signal detection, which is of utmost importance. Because in a given perceptual task, many a times one has to detect a given stimuli, what is referred to as signal in this theory, uh, in the backdrop of a non-stimuli and all non-stimuli would be considered as noise. Now, this means that a decision outcome always comes amidst some degree of uncertainty. For example, 
if uh, you know you are looking at me uh, where you do not have uh, no too many human images in the background then of course a detection of this signal okay in the th in terms of signal detection theory or in uh, psychological terms you no know, detection of me as a stimuli is very easy but if uh, you know i go on say a railway platform i go in a mob a huge gathering and then if you have to identify me amidst 1 lakh people 1000 people or even say 15 20 people okay it becomes a difficult task and therefore what signal detection theory says is that you always uh, know have certain degree of uncertainty uh, when you are given an opportunity to detect a signal uh, you have to uh, filter out a stimuli in the backdrop of all uh, the noise the non stimuli and therefore these decisions have to be taken amid certain degree of uncertainty now actually you look at this matrix no you have the signal and the possibility could be that either the signal is present or the signal is absent okay then you look at the extreme left okay you have the response and the possibility is that you say yes the signal was present or you say no so in terms of response you either have to say yes or you have to say no and the conditions could be that either the signal is present or the signal is absent so what could be the four possibilities then possibility 1 when the signal is present and you respond and you say yes it is then it is considered as hit okay you have given the correct response okay other possibility could be that the signal is not present but you still say yes it is present okay that's a false alarm so you are raising a false alarm okay you detect a signal in the absence of it this is the second possibility the third possibility where you actually miss a signal the signal is present but then you say that no the signal isn't present this is a miss condition and the fourth condition when the signal is absent and you say that yes it is absent so this is actually correct rejection so when you look at this colored matrix the two greens that you see here the hit and the uh, correct rejection these two green zones uh, no represent that these were the correct choices okay miss and false alarm both are uh, no the errors that you commit therefore uh, the theory of signal detection talks about uh, the index it's called discriminability index or d prime now d prime is actually the estimate of the strength of the signal okay so the signal is discriminated depending on the separation and the spread of noise and the signal and the noise curves how this theory came into uh, you know our understanding of the perceptual processes during second world war roc curve was used to analyze the radar signals remember technology was you know not so advanced in those days and uh, therefore you know uh, some uh, special uh, uh, attempts were made uh, so that uh, you know when uh, the war planes of the enemy enters your territory your radars are able to detect them and then this roc curve later on you know uh, got included into psychology Uh, where it was used for representing signal detection in psychophysics so you have the possibility okay the matrix that we saw here okay you have the possibility where okay this green uh, zone where the signal is present and you say yes it is okay or a possibility where the signal is present but then you say that no it is not present so you miss it so you see the straight line here no that's the you no know, value that you put here no uh, where you have the uh, green arrow by directional arrow there on the top no that's uh, you know the limit that you set okay so when we talked about this uh, you no know, discriminability index okay this actually referred to uh, you know this point where you set this target that this is the index no if it moves above this then you say that yes okay and if it is less than this then you say no and therefore the hit and the miss gets decided this way okay and so is the false alarm and correct rejection the signal is not present and you uh, know after the d prime that uh, index you say that uh, no it is not present okay uh, so it's a correct rejection okay and in the other case uh, when the signal is present but then you say that uh, no it is uh, no not so so the roc curve or the receiver operating characteristic curve okay as it is called 
uh, are plotted with the hits on the y axis and the false alarm on the x axis. Uh, look at this graph now, you have the proportion of the hits okay, and then you also have the proportion of the false alarms and then of course, you know you have uh, the chance level of response uh, wherein uh, you know depending on the d prime that you have set, okay, uh, you give your uh, hits and the false alarms. So, the detection of the signal okay, will actually uh, you know depend on your ability okay, to discriminate between uh, the the signal against the noise, the stimuli against the non-stimuli. So, when you look at the real life situation okay, uh, where the signal has to be detected you know in the backdrop of uh, the noise, uh, you see such uh, you know applications in the real life situation. Say uh, when uh, army camouflages the whole setup, you must have seen movies in real life, several images you know uh, where you have an individual you know who will put you know different colors on the face would uh, know uh, put some bushes on the hat will add some uh, know uh, bushes on the body also the uh, uniform that they wear they also have multiple colors okay and then uh, when you make a survey when you look at uh, the object from a distance okay you are not able to detect uh, know the background uh, and the stimulus so, the object uh, is not very clearly perceived against the backdrop that uh, against which it is seen. Now, look at this video, can you detect this man uh, against the background? It is extremely difficult. Now, this is you know uh, the usage of uh, signal detection theory okay, uh, when you talk of uh, human perceptual capabilities with respect to uh, know its application in uh, perceptual uh, processes. This happens simply because you fail to make, uh, make a distinction between the background and the object. Look at this image now, this is much more difficult, no? you cannot uh, know see the moving object in the background and this is uh, know the practical uh, application of camouflage where these things are deliberately done and it is uh, the responsibility of the other party to make uh, detection to detect this signal okay, against the noise and this is the practical application of signal detection theory in perceptual processes. I am right now you know, going to show you uh, the reversible images that you find you know uh, that are available in the common domain. Now, these are you know, some of the common images uh, that you find in several books of uh, behavioral sciences. Okay. Uh, when you look at this image you know basically uh, depending on you know the orientation of your uh, head you either see an old lady uh, which is in this position or you see the side profile you know, of a uh, young girl. Okay. This is the reversibility, now image remains constant, but what reversibility says that you know because you have uh, you no know, difference in terms of you know defining the contours and therefore, uh, because of this you always have a possibility wherein uh, the figure and the background gets uh, know, mixed. So, I am again making uh, know that search on uh, figure ground reversibility okay. and uh, you find uh, know interesting things on the net. Uh, know for example, uh, know if I just look at any of these images for example, I am looking at uh, this image right now. Uh, you can just see you know uh, that uh, find uh, you have uh, such a difference in terms of uh, the contours getting defined here uh, that in one case what appears to be shadow in the other case the same thing becomes an image. So, at times you know, uh, when we talk about uh, the contours how uh, it is important you know, uh, in terms of uh, making a distinction uh, between the object and the background, okay, it's, it plays really a very very important role and uh, uh, the higher uh, you know, the fuzziness here that uh, it is unclear. Uh, the possibility are that you make your own subjective contours and therefore, you give your own interpretations. For example, in this very image you know if you look at the extreme left okay, uh, you see uh, black swans you know that are flying in the sky whereas, you look on the extreme right okay, you see a white swan that uh, flies here you know, and it is just uh, you know a change that has been introduced here. Uh, similarly, say if I go to other images. Uh, this is uh, another important image that you uh, see in most of the books of behavioral sciences where uh, you find know that 
the figure and the backgrounds are not very very clearly defined and the primary reason you know why the figure and the backgrounds are not very very clearly defined okay uh, it's very difficult no here it's very difficult uh, to understand okay what actually represents the background and therefore what should be the image uh, so if you consider uh, that color is important here and uh, there is a white figure against a black background you see a flower base whereas if you consider white to be the background okay then you see know that uh, the profile of two human faces uh, looking at each other okay so these two black uh, you know faces in the white backdrop facing each other okay that could be one interpretation the other interpretation could be you know that you see a white flower base against the black background now because it is not defined here very clearly the contours and therefore the possibility you know that you yourself can see both okay at one time you look at the black uh, image at the other time you consider white to be the image and therefore that reversibility exists uh, when you search on the net you find you no know, hundreds of uh, interesting uh, reversible figures so with this discussion uh, let us now come to uh, you know certain different types of uh, perception so we first begin with uh, form perception now form perception actually depends on the organization one organizes uh, the pattern that one is actually looking at and also uh, one looks at uh, the groups how the groups has been formed now uh, for groups and patterns okay you have the full set of uh, principles what are called as the gestalt principles so uh, we will discuss gestalt principles uh, one by one first and the you no know, most uh, prominent one happens to be the law of pregnancy the law of pregnancy says you know that the simplest organization that demands minimal cognitive effort okay that is always looked upon by human beings so what one does therefore is uh, that one will always look for okay an effort where i have to put minimal effort and that minimal effort i see the simplest simplest organization emerging out of it simplest pattern emerging out of it and this emerges as a figure so simpler and symmetrical forms are very easily perceived if you make it more complex it is asymmetrical then it's difficult okay uh, this is gestalt principle uh, first that we are talking about you must have seen uh, when people write you uh, know uh, certain alphabet say for example i write a a a a now although uh, no these patterns differ okay uh, but practically what happens you do not uh, no get carried away by the different types of uh, forms that you see but what happens is that you see them as a okay so what law of pregnancy says is uh, that you have made a minimal cognitive effort okay you just look at these forms okay and the simplest organization okay that you are able to derive out of it okay helps you perceive it and therefore irrespective of the changes that you see you actually perceive it correctly and you read it a okay so this is the law of pregnancy we are uh, you no know, looking at uh, you no know, different uh, advertisements the way things have been uh, put in the world okay now this is a, a logo actually okay where it's very easy for you to actually make out what it wants to say you can organize it very simply the second gestalt principle is the law of similarity law of similarity says that the similar objects they tend to group together okay so the law of similarity actually means know that uh, when you look at objects okay all sim things that looks very much you uh, know uh, alike you tend to you uh, know group them together you put them together you find four circles here and finally you have 16 of them now so although they are independent circles we tend to perceive them as groups the colorless circles form one group now while the rows of red circles form another one now let us make this situation a little uh, more complex okay uh, we had just you uh, know four circles uh, finally uh, leading to 16 circles and we had uh, the red color ones and the colorless circles no so 
uh, this is how uh, we were trying to look at uh, the formation of groups based on similarity. Now, if you have uh, some uh, know, a much more complex situation, once again you have a row of 4 colorless circles multiplying into 4 rows. Just as the previous example, the blue circles form a group. When all of them become similar right now okay, uh, with their blue colors, the ones which are bigger either horizontally, vertically or diagonally they tend to form a group. So, we basically look at you know the difference okay, and depending on you know what you are actually trying to look at, okay, uh, you will always search for you know certain uh, reason based on which you can uh, form a group, so that you perceive it better. Look at uh, this very logo, okay. uh, it is a very commonly known logo to us okay. and uh, you know, actually when you uh, see here you find the law of similarity being used. Okay. What we discussed was that similar objects they will tend to come together okay. and here you have no three different uh, no representations. Okay. All of them they tend to group together because they follow the law of similarity. We come to the next law, law of proximity which says that the objects nearer to each other they tend to uh, form groups. Now, initially you see four columns of green circles that are equidistant, but when the two columns move closer to uh, each other, okay, uh, they tend to move uh, you know, uh, on the two ends they form two distinct groups. The first two columns form one group while the remaining two they form another group. Okay. Uh, so, this is the law of proximity. Initially, they were uh, you know, seen as uh, distinct columns okay, because you know, they were equidistant. Okay. But the moment you have a separation, now you see that you, know, you have uh, one column and the other column although color and the size, the form remains the same. This is uh, the law of proximity. If you have seen the recent uh, Olympics, okay, in this inaugural ceremony, this is uh, no one of the uh, form that uh, people saw. Now you see here, it's very distinct. No, what you see on the left, no, that six different uh, rows, and then you have uh, no another six different rows on the right side. Okay, it's a symmetrical type of a formation. Okay, even though you see this symmetrical formation, okay you classify them as you know, two uh, different types of formations. This is you know, actually a beautiful illustration of law of proximity okay. because they are closer to each other they tend to form a group. On the top you have you know, another long ray you see here you know, people with uh, you know, they are holding something uh, red in color whereas the ones uh, you know, on the center stage at the little back they are all you know, uh, sky blue in color. Okay. And you can very easily you know make a very clear distinction between them and this distinction one is able to detect because one is actually looking at these uh, you know images from the law of proximity. Okay. Proximate things, closer things they tend to come together because they tend to come together therefore, they are uh, perceived you know a little differently. When you look at uh, you know the different types of uh, logos once again. Okay, uh, here you see here no Europe Music Award 2002 in Barcelona. Okay, and here you can uh, very easily find out no how law of proximity works. Okay, so here you although you have uh, no uh, distinct uh, icons of uh, different logos of uh, different establishments. Okay, because no you are looking for the Music Award uh, ceremony. Okay, uh, therefore this is how no they have been put together and you see them as one, not as distinct ones. Okay, because of uh, know, the law of proximity. Another interesting gestalt principle is the law of continuity. The law of continuity says that continuous figures are preferred by us. Okay. So, something that runs in continuation, you can see a bold straight line entering from the left side of the screen. Now, another one enters from the right side. Although they are two separate lines as you initially saw, but when they join you see them as one straight line. When two more straight lines enter from top and bottom respectively, you perceive an x y coordinate. When two of these lines become red, green, blue or yellow, they are perceived as one continuous figure. When they are all black, you perceive them as x y coordinate. Let us look at another example of a law of continuity. 
Here you see dark black circles appearing on the screen. These circles are perceived as collective unit because they share a common feature of direction. Now, initially you know you look at it as a straight line, okay, and the moment this uh, you know the other line, the curve one, you know, uh, comes there, you perceive it differently. You see as if it represents uh, some type of direction. If you uh, visit, uh, you know. Indigo airline, okay. This is uh, one of the airlines uh, that uh, you must have uh, certainly seen here, okay. When you look at their uh, logo, okay, uh, actually you see what uh, no you saw here, okay. Now when you look here, no look at your screen, this very part where I am moving the cursor, okay, uh, you actually see this uh, law of continuity, okay. This image, although this is a collection of dots, something that you saw right now in this animation, okay. But the moment you uh, see here, no, it gives a direction, and it uh, no makes you feel that fine. You are actually looking at uh, something uh, visual representation of airline. Uh, this is again another image from uh, this year's uh, Olympics. No, once again you see here, no, the pattern that you see here. Okay, uh, you have uh, no uh, long uh, no clothes here of different colors. Okay. You have the red, you have the saffron, the yellow, the light green, the blue, the pink. Okay, now this is a no uh, interesting uh, pattern that you see here, and interestingly enough, it's the continuity. You no, know? so you have we all have a preference. You no, know? we perceive it as a continuous thing. You no, know? and even though there are uh, two different uh, you no know, clothes that come here. Okay, uh, they all combine there on the top where you have uh, no a lady there. Uh, no, uh, you tend to see it you no know, as a continuation. So all these formations independently they are combined together to look upon okay as one continuous image now you see here you have human rows here you have uh, you know the patterns emerging out of the clothes put here okay you have several other decorations here but then all of them get combined together and they have their uh, you know uh, distinct appearance because you see here the law of continuation working now let's look at uh, this uh, video You see here the law of continuation working. Now we come to the next Gestalt principle, that is the law of closure. Law of closure says that a discontinuous shape is perceived as complete if it represents something familiar. You see a circle right now, another one, and yet another one. Although you see eleven different circles, but you perceive them as a ring. Their individual identity is not taken into account. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, an important uh, no uh, thing here that uh, no when you look at uh, the continuous things okay uh, when you look at uh, the patterns that emerge okay the discontinuous shapes uh, is perceived as a complete okay if it represents something very very uh, familiar you look at uh, this uh, no famous visual uh, icon now this is a logo of uh, wwf if you uh, visit uh, their uh, site Okay, you see this image. You no, know, you see here. You no, know, where I am uh, moving the cursor right now. Okay, you see WWF. Uh, you no, know, you visit their site and you see exactly this very representation. Now, when you actually see it, okay, you can very easily make out what you are looking at, and you see it as panda because the gaps that you see, you try to you know uh, close it. You try to fill it, and therefore this is not you no know, looked upon as you know some uh, black. Filled areas against a white background, but rather it is looked upon as an animal. And uh, of course, now we come to the law of common fate, which says that objects that share common features they are grouped together. And another important one is the law of symmetry, uh, which says you now that symmetrical objects are collectively perceived. Look at the sky blue square and the blue square dropping out of it. This overlap. Helps you see another square. Let us look at these squares without any color. We will perceive them as two squares. When the top and the bottom parts are removed, we clearly see a small square. 
but when they are brought back we perceive two big squares overlaying each other. This demonstrates uh, that in spite of distance symmetrical objects are collectively perceived. Uh, once again uh, now when you look at uh, the logos you see the logo of uh, CSC and here you again see you know how symmetry has been used beautifully uh, for uh, representing uh, the organization. This is now time for us to recapitulate what we have discussed with respect to the perceptual processes.